Well, I'm very pleased today to be speaking with students and professors uh, at the um, Far Eastern Federal University in Vladivostok. And it's a real delight for me to be able to do this. And I wanna thank uh, Victoria very much. Uh, I kept uh, bugging her to uh, have this event, to offer this to students. And I also uh, wanna thank Archam uh, for his arrangements to really make this possible. And uh, so very glad to be here. Um, and let's see, I'm just letting more people in to the waiting room. Thanks for alerting me to that. So let me say, uh, when I was very young in what we call grammar school in the US, we studied a subject that I don't think they teach anymore. It's called geography. And it's about countries of the world and well, about your own country. And somewhere along the line, I uh, learned about, heard about Vladivostok. So it had a very imposing name. And I knew that it was um, far away. And, and today it still is kind of far away, I must say, uh, even by air, uh, not, not too easy to get to. And, uh, but anyway, uh, my great uh, desire was finally satisfied about five years ago when I visited Vladivostok. And I was at the end of a long train trip from Moscow, which uh, was very interesting all along the way. And I had this book here called the Trans-Siberian Guide, which I uh, used all the way along uh, the trip. And uh, in particular, it was relevant for Vladivostok, not having ever been there. Um, it did have a quote that I've not forgotten and which is relevant, I think, to, uh, to us today. Well, always because of your distance, your distance from uh, the Western part of the country. And the, uh, the statement here, I, can, I don't have to really read it, but this was concerning back at the time that the Bolsheviks were uh, taking over the country. They were fighting uh, the white Russians, the white Russian army. And when finally in 1920, the, uh, the Bolsheviks were successful, maybe you call it the Red Army, over the White Army, a message was sent to, um, to back to Moscow. And uh, let me pause again, admitting more people. So a message was sent back to Moscow uh, informing uh, Lenin of the success and, and capturing Vladivostok, if it can be called capturing. They, they had the, uh, that region, but the city importantly. And um, um, Lenin said this, it's a long way away, but it's ours. So that involved a lot of us stock being part of the Soviet Union and quite an interesting history of course since then. But uh, I visited the city. I wish I could have been there longer, but the city uh, actually um, reminded me of San Francisco and Seattle, the parts of it that I did see. I uh, didn't see that much of it, although I was taken around by some wonderful people for a day and a half. And uh, one of my important visits was with the Consul General of, uh, uh, of the uh, United States. And we had a long lunch together and he had and certainly had enthusiasm for the far east of Russia. And uh, I remember one of the things he said, and it's kind of obvious, but it, it is worthwhile recalling that he said that the US and Russia were horizontal countries, east to west, west to east. So horizontal countries, and both of them filled with many great resources. And I saw some hints of that as I took the uh, eight day trip from Moscow to Vladivostok. And it's one of the things I always like to talk about. And I know many people have wished that they could do that. And um, if any of you are thinking of going to Moscow sometime, I would um, go there, you know, go, uh, go from uh, east to west. And it's a wonderful experience. And uh, I really recommend the railroad, which is very well run, I must say. Um, so anyway, um, 
that was my experience in starting to get to know about Vladivostok and uh, very favorable opinions. And I had met Victoria at a couple of conferences and I, uh, I'm admitting more people now, um, at two conferences, one in the US and one uh, in, in Moscow actually. So uh, I had her acquaintance and uh, those I think uh, uh, were, maybe those were both after my visit to Vladivostok, but I always wanted to visit the university on my way living, leaving the city on, the, on my only trip there, I asked to be taken to see um, Ruski Island and the university. So I did see the site of the university. So that was kind of a tease for me to only uh, see the university in the distance as I was on the way to the airport. Um, but of course, I also know a very important event that has been occurring there every year, which is the uh, the Eastern Economic Forum. And uh, I think that that is, uh, has been a good development. It's very, very popular. Uh, I understand that they run out of hotel rooms in Vladivostok and people have to stay on ships. So it's so, nice to have that success, but uh, more hotel rooms are needed. That's for sure. So I hope some time to come back. And um, I hope perhaps even in lieu of coming back in person that I will have the opportunity to uh, reconvene uh, with you. And I'm going to go through a lot of material here in the next 35 minutes or so. Uh, it's quite a challenge to cover all these topics. And uh, uh, some of them I'd like to dwell on, but we'll have to keep going. And part of that is by design so that you will have good questions for me when the lecture part is over and I am available for your questions as long as you have them. So uh, let's start now with this commentary lecture about the US presidential uh, campaign. And this is something which uh, is a mystery to people outside the US and I think also to people in the US you know, who really elects the president? So uh, we're gonna talk around that issue and to that issue. So we'll talk about the state of the race. Who looks like the winner today? What are the polls showing? And uh, what do these polls mean? And we'll also talk about uh, this process of how we got here, this long process of 15 to 18 months, which is I think to the view of many people outside the US and inside the US, it's kind of, why do you have this long campaign? But we'll talk about the three phases of the campaign. We'll talk about the actual election process, talk about the significant dates that are involved uh, in this. And there'll be two dates I'll mention that you will know about and most Americans don't know about. And we'll also talk about the potential for chaos and crisis after November 3rd, election day, and talk briefly about the transition to a new government. So a lot to cover. So the first thing I wanted to mention here is who these candidates are, which may be evident to a lot of people, President Trump and his Vice President Mike Pence, and then uh, Joe Biden, former Vice President, who is running. But he picked uh, someone to run along with him as we, we call it on the ticket or on the ballot with him. And that is uh, Kamala Harris, who is a Senator, the upper chamber of our government uh, from California. So she's my Senator here and a uh, very unique person, uh, despite um, what you may think of her politics. If you're on the left, you love her. If you're on the right, you definitely hate her. Well, not hate her, but disagree with her son. So uh, Kamala Harris, what of her? She is a first generation American. Her parents were both immigrants to the United States. They're highly educated and uh, accomplished people. The mother is now deceased, but the father is a black, an African from the island of Jamaica in the Caribbean. Her mother, was born in India, in Chennai. So she is 
an Indo-American as well as a Black American, half and half. And I think it's a wonderful tribute to American democracy, which is often very messy and inconclusive and troublesome. Um, but nonetheless, someone could emerge as uh, a first generation American of immigrants. And not enough has been made of that, frankly, in this campaign. So let me go on to uh, move now to what's going on. Where are we? So people are now um, voting in at least 40 states in the United States, 40 states. And uh, they're either doing this by what you might call early voting, where they've been allowed to go to the polling place and cast votes. Now, this will start in California tomorrow, which is, is Friday here. And uh, that means there are polling places. Now, not as many as we used to have in other years because uh, people are getting uh, mail ballots. And I'll explain some of that. Now, Monday, this past Monday of this week, people started voting in person at uh, polling places in New York State. So a lot of people are voting. There's uh, about 80 million people in the United States that have already voted. That's more than half of the people who were expected to vote. And uh, the ballots went out to people in California uh, three weeks ago. So we received them in the mail and people are putting them back in special boxes or delivering them to polling places. Um, so the voting is underway. And you know any late breaking news or campaign moves that are made, a lot of people have already voted. They can't change their vote. So, but nonetheless, this is not a national election as such where the whole country votes. Uh, well, it all does vote, but by state, there are 50 states in the United States, as you probably know, and each of these states being having its own sovereign rights in many respects can decide on the processes by which people can vote in their own state. And most of it's pretty much the same, but some will have uh, ballots by request. Others, 10 states mailed out ballots to everyone on the rolls. Uh, and therefore those people really should return them by mail. Uh, an important thing to mention at this juncture uh, about these elections in these 50 states, that we have a chief uh, election officer in each state who's called the secretary of state who has other responsibilities. But one of the important thing is to uh, tally up the votes from the cities and counties throughout the state and to certify the results and say who won, who carried the state. And there'll be uh, contests as there already are, uh, which will be brought to the secretary of state of a given state and there'll be arguments and then it'll go to the local courts, uh, disputes regarding procedures, et cetera. So we're voting and uh, there will be uh, challenges to these votes as we go along. Well, who's ahead? Right now, according to the polls, uh, Biden is ahead. He, uh, is ahead. he is ahead in the national polls, uh, probably by 9% on average. Some of these national polls will uh, show him ahead by 10%, others by a lesser amount, but the average, as they say, the, rear, the real clear politics average is about 9%. And this will probably tighten up a little bit as we go along here, as it did four years ago. But Biden's ahead of where Hillary Clinton was four years ago in the national polls by a few points. Then there are also polls that are conducted in certain states where they think these are contested or could be contested. Now the national polls uh, usually will do a sample of about uh, maybe 900 to 1,000 voters. And any of you who are in the study statistics may want to question that small sample for a poll. In the states, it's usually 300 to 500. So these are only a small sample in the votes. Um, in some of the key votes uh, states, 
that uh, Trump carried the last time, uh, for example, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. He carried each of those states by a very small margin. And the total uh, of votes of the three states that he won, total number of votes margin was only 87,000. Now, right now he is behind Biden in all three of those states by a greater margin than he was against Hillary Clinton. So he, he closed the gap four years ago, but can he close it again? Who knows? Uh, one thing I'll say about the polls and the uh, Trump supporters make this point that the Trump supporters are shy. You wouldn't think that from the rallies that Trump has around the country and their fervor for him. But actually when they're asked in a poll, who are you voting for? They won't say it. They feel intimidated by the national media. media. And so they don't like to answer the polls. They feel it's their own business. So it could be that these polls are understating the Trump vote. And that was certainly true four years ago. Uh, also, uh, we have a strange anomaly here in that someone can uh, win the popular vote, all the votes tallied across the country, and still lose the election. And that happened uh, in 2000, the year 2000, and it happened again in 2016. And I'll explain why that is. So uh, let me mention um, quickly about the three phases of this election, this long process. The first phase, uh, which was started back in the middle of, or maybe the fall of 2019, as these presidential contests uh, normally do, they start uh, the year before. The candidates announce, they start forming committees, they start raising money for the campaign. And uh, so that goes until the early part of the election year. So that one from mid-year or so on up to the beginning of uh, 2020. 23 Democrats declared uh, for this, which was unprecedented that that many people wanted to run for president and would actually have a campaign. So, uh, however, these candidates were weeded out or we would say they were vetted by the people. So the second phase is the primary phase and the convention phase. So a number of primaries are conducted. So in, in individual states, there are elections to decide who will represent that state in the party's national convention. And as this went along, um, people fall out. They run out of uh, um, money to do their campaign. They're not able to participate in the debates that go on. And uh, they don't win anything. And actually Biden was in that case until the South Carolina primary, which he won. And then of course his challenger, uh, Bernie Sanders, the avowed socialist in the race was getting a lot of support, a lot of delegates and the party establishment didn't like that. So they swung their support to Biden, which is exactly what happened four years ago. So the socialist candidate was prevented uh, from really getting the nomination. Uh, then also in that second phase, we have the convention. Each party has a convention at which they formally nominate or name the candidates. And that happened in late August. Usually it's July because of the pandemic. Those both were virtual conventions. So then we have the third phase after the convention where uh, the campaign really starts. And this begins on Labor Day in the United States, which is the first Monday in September. That's about, I would say, oh, uh, nine weeks of the campaign. That's the real campaign. People have, have had their vacations. They come back to work after Labor Day. The children come back to school and uh, the country is back and ready to do business ready to pay attention to politics. So we're in that campaign right now, the third phase. And let me mention something here. And you heard it first from me 
Uh, this campaign may have uh, a similarity to a campaign of 1948. And that was the campaign of President Truman, who was finishing one term, and a Republican by the name of uh, Governor Tom Dewey. Well, all during that period, Dewey started more and more to avoid the press, not to have rallies, not to have speaking engagements, but just to play it cool because he was ahead by four or five points in the few polls that they conducted then. So he said, I'm not gonna expose myself to making a mistake. I'm gonna be quiet. Truman went out and campaigned all over the country by train and he had big crowds at his campaign stops. And Trump, likewise, an incumbent president, is behind in the polls, as Truman was. And he has campaigned all over the US, sometimes going to three states in one day, uh, all by airplane. And uh, so it could be, and he's getting enormous crowds, gigantic crowds. So maybe this is indicative of um, the uh, support that he has, which um, isn't appearing in the polls. I'll drop in another indicator here, uh, which is kind of humorous, but it has turned out to be true that in the presidential contest, the tallest candidate wins almost all the time. And Donald Trump is six foot, two inches tall, and Biden is six feet tall. So, We'll see whether that means anything, but that's kind of an interesting uh, indicator. But nonetheless, uh, Trump has uh, got a hard time here. Four years ago, they said of him, he has no path to victory. He cannot get enough votes to win. This year, they're saying he has a narrow path to victory behind in the polls. So. Uh, what are some of the issues that have been driving this? Clearly at this point, the management of the uh, pandemic, the COVID crisis has become the predominant issue with uh, Biden and the Democrats saying that uh, Trump hasn't managed it properly, didn't do the right things at the right time. And uh, which is a little surprising because I think uh, Trump did a lot at the beginning of the year especially cutting off travel from China and from uh, the, the EU. Um, so, uh, but anyway, he hasn't defended himself sufficiently on this. The Democrats have adopted a convincing narrative of mismanagement of the crisis. Now, of course, two things are happening as they are in other countries. People continue to die. So now we have 225,000 people that are dead in the US. And if that number keeps growing, you don't look too good uh, as the uh, head of the country. And the second thing is in about um, at least 10 states, we are having spikes in uh, cases. So all of that is not good. So I think that's gonna be the driving force in determining these votes. Normally the economy is a big issue um, uh, here. In, in all of the American elections. Uh, and in fact, the Clinton contest, the Bill Clinton contest in 1992, that campaign had a slogan uh, uh, that came out of their uh, war room sessions where they planned the campaign. They wanted to remind everyone they were running against uh, George H.W. Bush, who was a international figure because of the uh, Gulf War and saving Kuwait from Iraq. And uh, uh, Bush was uh, a foreign policy expert, but the Clinton people felt there was a small recession going on and the economy would be the issue. So they adopted the slogan, it's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, reminding their campaign that that was what to focus on. So, but I think in this case, the economy is, uh, although it's coming back fast, in fact, today we had the report that the US economy increased over the last quarter, 33%, an astounding number, 33% increase in GDP in just one quarter. 
there are some other issues uh, which perhaps you can ask me about. Uh, I I'm running a little bit behind my clock here. So uh, I'm not gonna, I'll just mention them. You can bring them up. The issue about the vacancy on the Supreme Court and uh, social justice uh, in the United States, uh, law and order. And then also the charges against Biden, uh, corruption charges, which have not been picked up by the media, uh, really. Uh, so Trump keeps pounding on that, but it does not resonate with the media uh, or really making an impression. His advisors are telling him, talk about the economy. Uh, don't talk about attacking Biden. So, so what's the election process? Skipping quickly to that topic. Um, well, way back when the United States was formed as a country, in the late 18th century, uh, we had a constitution that was approved in 1787, 1787. And one of the last issues in the constitution was to figure out how are we gonna pick a president? Um, we don't want a king, we want someone else. Uh, what shall we call that person? And how do we select them? Well, there was the idea at the time of popular democracy as we know it today and people voting. So the people who gathered and they decided we're gonna have each state. And at that time, it were only 13 states and they were called the United States. They used to be the United Colonies under Britain. But the United States was with a small U, not the uppercase U we have today, a small U. So the emphasis on the states. So they would say each state would select eminent people, virtuous people who would meet in the state and vote on the president. And they were called the electors. We're still doing that today, except for the fact that the people in the states select or elect the electors. So despite the fact that Trump's and Biden's names are on the ballot, uh, actually the people who are being voted for are the electors. And it's a system that uh, uh, really confuses people in the US and certainly people from outside the US look on this. And they say, do you think you have a democracy? You don't, because the people are not electing the president. They're electing, uh, they're electing uh, the electors. So uh, these people meet and cast votes. And the amount of uh, votes you have, electoral votes that you have is determined by the number of senators. Every state gets two. And then it goes uh, also by the number of Congress people. Is this is if you know you have the uh, Duma in Russia, and uh, here in the U.S. we have the House of Representatives. So states with a lot of population have more congressmen, more representatives than the small states. So they all meet in the state capitol and they cast their votes. But the people who are selected depends on who was elected by which party on election day, and they, we need 270 votes to become elected president, 270. So here are the significant dates. November 3rd, that's coming up next Tuesday, five days away. And people are be, going to vote for these electors. They don't even know the names. The names are with the Secretary of State in the state capitol. The names aren't published in the newspaper. It's not that they're hidden. You can go, you can contact the Secretary of State's office, which I have done. I have gotten the list of Democratic elector candidates and Republican elector candidates in two states, Michigan and North Carolina. So I know who these people are. I know who's gonna be elected. Um, so it takes some trouble, but it's kind of immaterial as far as most people are concerned. So. Well, these people are elected on November 3rd. And then on December 14th, now that was one of the four dates I'm telling you about. November 3rd, December 14th, January 6th, and January 20th. On December 14th, the people 
uh, gather in the state capitals, the electors, and cast their ballots. There's an elaborate ceremony. They sign documents and they say, I've signed this document saying I'm voting for the candidate of my party, Republican or Democrat, which in this case will be uh, Trump or Biden. And all those are packaged up and they're sent to the nation's capital. And there, they're all counted from all the states, all 50 states and the District of Columbia. They're all counted. And then finally, the result is announced. But we already know the result because we know whose electors were elected in a state, okay, on November 3rd. But the formality by the Constitution requires the Electoral College to meet and then to count the votes in Washington on January the 6th. And then the president is inaugurated on January the 20th. So those are the four dates. And most Americans don't know anything about December 14 and June 6th. I mean, January 6th, and November, uh, December 14th and January 6th, oh, yeah, don't know about it. Um, so now what's the uh, possible chaos or crisis that could occur? Well, with all these mail ballots that have come in and many people never having used a mail ballot, they may not uh, do it properly. So uh, the mail ballot, you have to have a postmark on it, no later than election day. You have to sign it and your signature has to be equal, uh, look like the signature on file with the authorities. So um, if you send in a ballot and for some reason it wasn't postmarked, that'll be rejected. If your ballot doesn't have your signature or you can't, it can't be read or um, you know, some other problem, it will be rejected. Now in most states like California, the voter will be contacted to um, you know, try to uh, cast their vote again, but not after November 3rd, that's for sure. In any event, uh, normally with mail-in ballots, 2% of the mail-in ballots are rejected because the ballots lack the signature or are damaged. So in a close election, and Trump carried three states I mentioned earlier by less than 1% of the vote. So if you have a close election of electors and you have 2% or more of the ballots being rejected, that's the difference in the election. So that's gonna be a big point of controversy all during November. And you will hear about and see uh, what's going on with uh, challenges to the votes in various states, and especially where there is a close vote in what they call the swing states, which are six or seven, depending on how you do the analysis, what's the, the swing states. So that's something uh, which is co concerning. Now, this was so bad that uh, in the year 2000, when uh, George W. Bush was running against Vice President Gore, Gore had more popular votes than Bush. But the one state that was still resolving the issue was Florida. Where, where Bush only had five, uh, 457 votes more than Gore. So out of millions cast, it was only less than 500 ahead. And to make a long story short, it was contested in court. The state court ruled favorably for the Democrats. And then the, uh, it was put up to the Supreme Court of the United States that gave a ruling which in effect favored the Republicans. So uh, Bush got all of Florida's votes despite, uh, you know, and he became president despite losing the popular vote. So there's gonna be quite a bit of contention, I think, with uh, this election because of the mail-in ballots. How many will be rejected? How many will be spoiled, et cetera? So what else is going on? Well, I've just added this element uh, to my uh, briefing, 
And it's called the transition because as we get close to the election, people start wondering, well, if Biden's going to win, uh, what's going to happen? And what that means is that uh, uh, we have to decide who the new government will be. So there are three stages. There's the transition which goes on before the election where a group of people starts to think about who can go into the government if, um, if we win the election, okay? Who's, who do we want in there? And then the second phase is when the election is done, no more campaigning, then you really start competing for the high level government positions, as well as the thousands of uh, positions throughout the US government. And that'll go on with mainly a lot of high level people named. And then you get to January 20th, when the new president can really, or the reelected president takes over and they will decide uh, who's gonna fill all these positions. And in the case of Biden, uh, he's got a very elaborate process, which is he has a transition team of five people who represent various constituencies. There's a paid staff that does all the work of trying to find good people to be appointed uh, and to make sure that various interest groups and constituencies, interest groups are favored, at least with consideration, if not uh, actually getting a position. And then the third, thirdly, in September last month, uh, Biden named a group of advisors. He's got 15 people who, again, uh, were going to be giving us advice, like pick this person for this department, pick this other person. And there's a tension right now on the Democratic side between Biden, who is left of center, I believe, not really a centrist. Uh, and then Bernie Sanders, his whole group of people, the um, socialist wing, but in the US we call it progressive. They want to control the government. So there's gonna be a lot of fight going on um, after the election when they won't be fighting with the Republicans, they'll be fighting with each other. And uh, again, after the election, if, if Biden's elected, uh, there'll be um, a lot of names that will come into the news. And one of them just emerged today who has been spoken of, that's Elizabeth Warren, who is from Massachusetts. Again, a liberal, almost progressive candidate uh, who contested uh, Biden for the nomination. She was one of those 23 candidates and the last to concede to him that he had the nomination. She's being mentioned for treasury secretary, an important position, but there's four or five other names out there. So Biden will have to make that decision. Now on the Trump side of things, they're going to be looking at things and say, who's going to stay or who wants to stay or who has to go? People that Trump may not like, uh, but he didn't want to do it before the election. So, but if he does win, he's going to get rid of some people pretty fast. So we're in the, we're approaching transition. So in any event, I think that um, this is an interesting contest. I'm uh, flattered by your interest in wanting to hear about this long and protracted process in the United States. It's a very unique element of the electoral college and electoral votes, which goes back to, again, the 18th century. So um, perhaps if things are messy enough in November and December, and if you aren't tired of hearing about it, you can invite me back to give you a report on what's going on. And uh, I certainly wish that it would be an invitation to come back to visit the campus. So uh, thank you to Victoria and Artem for pulling this together. And thank all of you very much for listening to this story. And uh, 
be happy to hand uh, take some questions. Anyone want to uh, unmute and just shout out a question? Okay, oh, okay. Um, I have a question for you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So. Yes. Um. Um. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you. Um. Uh, I, I, yes, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Huyen. Uh, I'm from Vietnam. I'm the, uh, I'm the, I'm the first year student. And I have the question for you that, uh, can you uh, demonstrate your opinion that uh, how media bias affect the US election? Because I also, um, receive many much information about the US election and I think that uh, there are there is media by us in the election in the US election because uh, I recognize that CNN uh, seems to be uh, prefer Joe Biden more than Donald Trump well that is correct the uh, Trump camp, and the Republicans feel that the uh, mainstream media favors Biden and they suppress news about uh, Trump that is favorable. And one example of that is this whole issue of corruption and payments from China uh, to Biden and his family and payments from Ukraine to, to Biden, to the, to the son, Hunter Biden. So uh, this is a big complaint that the Republicans have. And it's not only the mainstream media in terms of coverage in the press, like the New York Times, Washington Post, but also CNN, uh, MSNBC, and more significantly also um, the Silicon Valley social media is biased against Trump. Uh, that's their contention. So. Uh, I guess I would have to agree with that, um, that really um, there's, there's almost never any favorable news about Trump. It's only on Fox News that he gets any coverage. So anyone else? Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your election. And uh, basically I've got a question concerning social media as well. Um, uh, you know that we had hearings in the Senate with the CEOs of the three biggest uh, tech corporations in the US. And we actually knew that uh, Mark Zuckerberg hired 35,000 censors in Facebook. So and uh, concerning this uh, media bias in terms of uh, the presidential debates and presidential campaigns, can we expect uh, like a uh, social media reform in the US in the nearest future? Because America is known to be uh, the home of freedom and democracy, freedom of speech. So, and uh, I, I suppose that uh, this kind of bias is not that acceptable in such a country. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a very good question, very relevant because of the appearance before the Senate committee, as you say. Um, so the Republicans are very strong on this. They really feel that social media is biased, uh, whereas some of them um, will say, the social media executives, CEOs, will say that, oh no, it's all done by algorithms, which are impartial. Uh, but there are too many examples, I think, to make their, uh, to have that point of view be credible. Um, however, as much as the Republicans may have these charges, unless they control the government the next time, nothing's going to happen. So they're in control of the Senate, they lose the Senate, they don't have the House anyway, the House of Representatives. And if they lose the presidency, they're not gonna do anything about it. And uh, there'll be no changes to the uh, controls or regulations on social media. And there's a very precise um, regulation that's called the Regulation 230, 
which exempts the social media companies from the same kind of communications constraint uh, that television has and the press has. So uh, it's all going to depend on who controls the government. Unless Republicans control both houses, it's just going to be a lot of political talk. And depending on your point of view, you can either be happy if you're a Democrat that the social media uh, is favoring your candidate. Um, if you're a Republican, you're unhappy. So, and uh, let me, uh, I'm gonna have someone here to unmute. They've got their hand up. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for your lecture. I'm uh, Denis Alexander. And as a Russian international relations student, it's really interesting for me to know expert opinion about questions that sounds like, who is the best candidate to strengthen uh, Russian-American ties, Joe Biden or Donald J. Trump? Well, that's um, a tough question. Let me say a few things. Uh, I mean, I would assume, I, I, I would say that probably Trump uh, would be more open to this. Um, you know, he has a, a personal relationship with President Putin. And, uh, you know, he said some admiring things about Putin, which uh, got him into a lot of trouble with the, the opposition. Uh, but he's a practical man. He's a deal maker. And um, so that would seem to be promising. Um, now, in the case of Biden, we don't know what his personal views really are, I have to say, on Russia. There's been no real demonstration of that. We, uh, he was responsible in the uh, Obama administration for policy towards Ukraine and also policy towards uh, China, to a degree, at least uh, at a top level. And that's what got him into some trouble, at least his son trying to trade on the name. But um, probably more relevant to the question is, it's been the Democratic Party that has used Russia against Trump uh, for three years. All they've complained about is Russia, Russia, Russia. And uh, so any uh, rapprochement with uh, Russia that might eventually occur, in my opinion, that's not gonna be at the top of their list uh, to, do, to do with. Uh, that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, because it would be very hypocritical for them to do that. So I hope that helps. It's really unknown. Um, but I think that uh, the Republicans have been more practical on the Russia issue than the Democrats. And there's a lot of foreign policy elites, foreign policy elites who um, um, really... Uh, want a hard line against Russia, to my perception. So- May I ask see. a question? Yes, uh, let's see, uh, okay, right there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so thank you for this amazing insight into American politics. It, it, it was really interesting to hear an American, uh, his like thoughts. I want to ask you about uh, like partisan division because America was, is really divided now uh, and uh, we can see this partisan infighting now on, on the streets. Uh, do you think uh, what president could uh, unite the country? Uh, yeah, what president could unite the country and is it even possible uh, at this moment? Will these elections change this partisan division? Well, unfortunately, I have to answer that I don't believe that either of them can unite the country. The feelings are so bitter and it's so divided uh, that uh, neither, no matter who wins, half the country is going to be unhappy unless there's a really big swing uh, for one or the other. But still, even if there is a big vote one or the other, there's still gonna be a lot of people that are unhappy. And this division, uh, really the significant thing with the division 
is that it's based on cultural attitudes. So it's been a long time coming that there are these cultural attitudes uh, that are producing these political changes. Uh, some of the states which have been reliably Republican uh, are becoming less so. You know, we have these, we say the blue states are for the Democrats and the red states are for the Republicans. And, uh, but there are red states that are becoming purple. Uh, for example, Georgia and Arizona. So uh, I, I don't know who can unite the country. And it's, um, I think it represents a uh, strategic uh, weakness. And I hate to say that, strategic weakness for the United States uh, going forward vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Now, of course, the government that's in is in. And as President Obama said, when they had a successful election, he said, elections have consequences. Elections have consequences. So if you get in and um, uh, put your people in the government, uh, you're in control. But as far as the partisan divide, I don't see that going away and neither one will be happy with the outcome. So anyone else want to unmute and ask a question? I would like to ask a question. Yes. Oh. yes. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It was really interesting. Uh, and I want to ask a question in topic which was doubted by our government and president in uh, 2008. Um, how do you suppose uh, four years is the optimal and effective period for implementation of the presidential um, policy and democratic state and why? Well, that's right. I think if I recall correctly, you have a six year term in, uh, in Russia for president. Um, well, four years should be long enough. Um, but uh, again, on implementation of policies, that's done by the president and the departments and the government really. Um, but if you have just complete opposition as Trump has had with the House of Representatives for the last two years, anyway, the last two years, it's hard to get the money to do things. Uh, it can also be hard to uh, uh, appoint people I mean, it's possible that Trump could win uh, the electoral vote, but lose the popular vote again, and he could lose the Senate. And if he doesn't, if he loses Senate, it's going to be a long, slow walk to get the new government installed. And he ran into some of these same problems uh, four years ago, that it took, it took 12 to 15 months to get everybody approved by the Senate, the policy makers. So um, uh, I think that the place where the president has the greatest opportunity to lead and do things is uh, in foreign policy. Uh, and that's true of no matter who is president because you're not constrained really, unless you, you start to have uh, some military conflicts. But if it's just foreign policy and, and diplomacy, you can do a lot. And Trump has tried to do that. He has uh, tried to establish rapport with other foreign leaders and um, some successes, uh, some nothing much happened. So, uh, I mean, as an example would be uh, the three accords that were signed between Israel and three Arab countries during the last four to five weeks. That would have been, if this wasn't an election year, and if the press was favorable to, to Trump, uh, that would have been headline news, and it was hardly covered. And then earlier this week, I think it was on Monday, if not Tuesday, um, the US signed a defense accord with India, which a lot of people thought this will never happen. But the China has done certain things, uh, and India is uncomfortable and five separate agreements were signed in New Delhi between India and the United States. Well, that was all instigated by Trump. 
and his people, the Secretary of Defense and the, um, uh, the Secretary of State actually went to New Delhi and signed these accords. So presidents can lead and be effective in foreign policy. So anyone else? Yes, I have a question for, about uh, electoral college and specifically faithless electors, uh, because there were a news on um, in in the summer that the Supreme Court allowed uh, the states to ensure new laws about the faithless electors and that they shouldn't be possible. Uh, has any state uh, passed these sorts of laws and even mm, is there even a threat of faithless electors in this election cycle? Well, that's a very, very good question. You obviously have followed that issue closely. So it's the uh, issue of what, again, we'll say faithless, faithless electors, the people who are on a slate and they end up being elected, and but they don't vote for who they're supposed to. And uh, every out maybe, I don't know, every two or three cycles, maybe there'll be one person that won't. Well, this has become more of an issue because four years ago, Hillary Clinton lost five electors and Trump lost two. And, uh, but it's up to the individual states uh, to decide what to do about that, either to pass a law which does not allow that, and not all the states have it. And also, uh, what is the penalties if you, if you uh, abandon your candidate, if you become faithless? And there's a book about, there's a book out about this, and it's called Faithless Electors, and it's available on Amazon. And I've read the book and I know the author, met the author. Um, so uh, some of these people who, um, were not party loyalists or party regulars, if you will, but the state that they were in, like Washington State, Colorado, and I think also in Texas, the people who were elected said, well, they did a lot of research. They were conscientious. And they said, according to the Constitution, I'm supposed to exert my judgment. I'm a person who's been selected and I will decide who I will vote for. And there was some relevance to that, but most of these people were not party regulars, you know, of the five that Clinton lost. And uh, so they abandoned Clinton. Uh, it was very embarrassing for her. Now, the real crucial issue will be if it's close between Biden and Trump, uh, let's say, uh, Biden has 270 votes, um, electoral votes, uh, but they haven't been cast yet. It's indicated he'll have to, if there are certain people there that don't like him that said, well, I'm gonna vote for Bernie Sanders, then Biden won't have enough votes. Uh, and that can lead to a whole nother scenario, a constitutional crisis. Um, and uh, looking back to the year 2000, um, George uh, Bush won by only one vote. He had 271 votes when he got the votes from Florida. Again, that was decided by the Supreme Court. So if we get to close votes, electoral votes, this will be uh, very significant. Obviously, um, one would think the parties have learned from this and they're going to enforce that the electors do the right thing. But if they aren't political people, like these five were not, who didn't have a political future, what do they care? Maybe they want to go in the history books. So it's a close election. They will, and they'll certainly, be on, the, uh, on the Trump side, if it's close and he's only ahead by one, you can be sure that uh, there'll be pressure on the Trump electors to defect. So I'm going to go to Daria and ask her to unmute. I see her hand. Daria. Uh, 
Thank you for your interesting and informative speech. Uh, my name is Daria. Uh, I'm a first year student of international relations. So uh, we pay a lot of attention to the coronavirus crisis uh, in every country and in America, of course, there are many economic and social challenges that need to be addressed. So what measures do you consider the most necessary to implement after taking over as a new president? And do you think can any one of candidates take right actions to address these issues? Thank you. Yes, well, uh, the point is that, um, you know, Biden can't do anything about this until January the 20th, can't do anything about it. Uh, now he could speak, if, if the Democrats get control of the Senate, then he could talk about the Congress passing certain laws that would require certain practices. So to that extent, if he's elected, he can uh, uh, get some ideas implemented. Um, he's been outspoken on this, but all the things that, I wouldn't say all, but it, it appears that many of the things that Biden has advocated to try to control uh, the spread, Trump has already done. So there's nothing new there. More testing, I mean, we're doing a lot of testing. And you can say that we didn't do enough testing early on, but there were constraints to that. So I, uh, uh, unless they get control of both houses, they're not gonna be able to do anything. And as far as having a national mandate to require everybody to wear a mask and everybody to maintain social distancing, uh, that's, those are the two most effective things, uh, in my opinion, that you can do for the population. I think Trump has gotten into a lot of trouble and uh, justifiably so because of showing a what would be seen as a careless attitude towards the pandemic and uh, not wearing a mask, whereas Biden always wears the mask. And of course, it was embarrassment that Trump contracted the virus himself and his whole family, or at least uh, his wife and his son did. So um, um, that'll be a contentious issue, but there'll be only limited things that Biden can do and I mean, January is uh, you know almost three months away, so uh, uh, that's the best I can answer. Let me go to Andre, who has not asked a question before. So if you would, uh, uh, you have unmu unmuted, Andre. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. I would like to ask the question concerning the Supreme Court and potential long-lasting impact of its like turning to more conservative side of the political spectrum, how, in your opinion, it could influence and shape American politics in the, in the middle term or in the long term? Well, it certainly will shape, and that's a very good question. Um, right now, you have six of the nine having been appointed by Republican presidents, six of the nine. Um, and that was why there was a struggle because the vacancy that was occurred, that occurred was of someone who was uh, very liberal uh, in her opinions, um, favoring uh, different kinds of women's rights, if you wanna say that, not, I mean, women should have rights, of course, but uh, she was seen as a champion of that. So they did, and on the issue of uh, abortion and healthcare, uh, she was a champion on those issues. So anyway, they did get uh, the six person in um, and it turned out that uh, without her, it would seem to still be five to four. It was, you know, up until recently. But the chief justice, although he was uh, appointed by a Republican, was starting to side with the Democrat appointed justices so that uh, he was not a reliable or he was becoming less reliable as a uh, conservative vote. Uh, but now, if the Chief Justice sides with the Democrats, you still have five to four. So they've got a solid conservative majority. No question about that. Um, the, uh, and I will say something here that a lot of people don't realize. 
of the uh, nine justices, six of them are Catholic. Um, Amy uh, Conan Barrett is Catholic, and that was made very clear. So she's Catholic. And actually, even Gorsuch was born a Catholic. He's now Episcopalian. So you've got six Catholics, one Protestant, and two Jewish uh, by, by, by religion uh, there, three, rather. So it's um, weighted in religion, but we don't really have religion, I don't think, in our politics. Uh, going forward, um, well, you know, uh, the longest serving justice now is Clarence Thomas. And he swore in uh, Amy Coney Barrett uh, on Monday night. And um, he's looking kind of old to me. So how much longer is he gonna stay on the bench? I haven't heard of any health issues, but he has been on there for uh, 28 years. So uh, if he goes off in the next year or two and Biden is the president and has a democratic Senate, then he's gonna have an opportunity. But as it stands today, uh, conservative judicial philosophy predominates on the, um, on the Supreme Court. And more significantly, Trump has appointed 230 other federal judges, more than anyone else has ever appointed. So he's uh, been helped in this by the Senate. So I think the best you can tell going forward, this will be uh, what they call a strict constructionist uh, attitude on the US Constitution. And there's a lot of legal nuances involved. Uh, let me go back to Michael here. I think, Michael, did you still have a question? Yeah, I do. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. So I've got a question concerning the so-called Blackset. So we know that there are many states in America where African-Americans votes are vital for winning and some polls or at least as Trump claims, show they show the so-called Blackset or the transition of Black Americans from the uh, Democrats to Republicans. So uh, my question is, do you think that it is possible that Trump, due to his pro-African-American policies, such as the First Step Act and the support of uh, HBCUs, will make Blackseat happen and attract enough African-American votes to win? Thank you. I believe that he will. And I think no one has a good estimate of how what percent he will get. Uh, generally, uh, the Republicans only get 5% or more from the black uh, community. Um, there are people who are predicting that he'll get at least 15%, and it could be higher. In all of my time in following US politics, um, the, uh, uh, I've never seen so much black support from people who are business people, media people, sports people, uh, many different kinds of people are supporting Trump. And he's got a lot of support, when I say a lot of, vocal support from young black men. And I think that uh, one of the reasons that uh, Biden early on, when he thought he'd have the nomination, came out and said he was going to pick a black woman for his running mate. I think he saw that Trump was making a headway in the black vote. So I think that uh, Trump will do very well and it could be decisive in certain states. So that's where I see the black vote going. And I guess I would agree that what I know of what his policies have been, that um, if he doesn't get at least 15, he probably 15% would be a good number, I think. So um, let me turn now to Alyssa Veta. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for your lecture. It was really interesting. I have a question. So what do you think if Donald Trump wins uh, this election, will Russian government again be exit uh, uh, of 
a cyber attack uh, like it was in 2016? Well, that's very possible. It's already happened. You know, this, um, I don't know how close all of you have been following this, but there was a, um, a Biden's son, Hunter, had a laptop and it was left in a repair shop. And without getting into too many details, uh, it, was the, it was eventually turned over to the FBI and the laptop uh, revealed all these uh, emails implicating not just Hunter Biden in payments from China and Ukraine, but also his uncle, that is Joe Biden's uh, brother, and the Joe Biden himself implicated in uh, pay for play, if, if you might call it that way. And uh, well, the Democrats, what do they say? This is Russian disinformation, Russian disinformation. They've already accused Russia of this. It's already happened. Uh, so, and I don't know what, what they'll come up with if uh, Biden loses, but um, you know, to take a pretty obvious situation and say, accuse the Russians of it is, uh, shows you where they're going. Um, let me go to Maria. Yes. Yes, good morning, Professor. I would like to say, I'd like to ask how the Democratic and uh, Republican parties feel about electronic voting in the United States. About what? Just uh, say, repeat that. Electronic voting. I didn't catch that. Sorry. Maybe someone else can repeat. Uh, electronic the question elections. was about electronic, electronic Election. voting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, electronic yeah. voting? By internet, probably. Oh, yeah. uh, well, it's not been an issue and no one has advanced it. I think partly because uh, there's uh, concern about cyber intrusion and cyber attacks. Um, you know, all of this, the mail-in ballots and even the in-person ballots these are all, this is all paper that has to be read by machines. So uh, I think there's uh, no one has advanced that uh, mainly because of uh, what's been voiced before about uh, Russian bad actors and maybe even worse so Chinese uh, bad actors. And I think that probably in the popular mind, the Chinese are even more um, suspect of having the capability of doing this. So if you're electronic voting, well, we see it all the time with credit card records, banks, and anything else that involves a consumer, uh, the black hats are able to hack in to electronic systems. So people would rather uh, cast paper ballots, have them read by machines, and then report the totals. So no one wants to go near that, uh, frankly. So, um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> let me answer this question <laughs> from Leonid. Uh, why uh, does the, uh, the parties only um, recruit older candidates? Well, um, it, just by circumstance, uh, you know, uh, Trump had a long business career and he wanted to do something else. Uh, so he finally, despite threatening before, finally decided he'd had enough of business, he'd get into politics. So he happened to be older. Biden, uh, you know, has been around, as they say, for 47 years. Um, but, um, you know, in the process of um, the primaries, the second phase I talked about, or even the first phase, the, uh, there were a lot of young people that uh, advanced themselves. And this was true somewhat also four years ago in the Republican Party, that um, uh, they fell by the wayside. They didn't have the political insiders. But I think there is a growing sense that uh, the country is being run by too many older people. Um, for example, the other senator from California, 
Diane Feinstein is 87 years old, the other senator, and they're talking of trying to get rid of her somehow. Um, so it's just circumstance, but I think more people will, more younger people will be stepping forward. That's for sure. Now I see someone's name here I can't read, but the name has been up for a while and I'm gonna ask them to unmute. It's, um, there you uh, yeah, there. Thank, there you, you, thank go. you for this opportunity. Yeah. Um, also, thank you for your lecture. Uh, it was an honor for me to be here. Uh, what do you think about uh, why Barack Obama uh, cheer up and uh, urge people to vote for Biden? Uh, as an example, in Twitter and other social networks, maybe on TV, on media sphere. Well, I think he owed it to Biden. He was a uh, loyal vice president uh, to, to Obama, uh, but he took a long time to endorse him in the phase two, you know, in that time of primaries. And it was late in the game, um, you know, from the Republican side, from an analyst side, you could say that Obama really doesn't, uh, think that Biden can be a good president. He's too old, probably. Um, and of course, uh, it appeared that Biden, well, that Obama last time kind of encouraged Biden not to run, encouraged him not to run. His son had just died. So um, I think, but now the reason he's supporting him is because it is he dislikes Trump so much. Uh, Trump has attacked Obama. He's attacked him for four years. And uh, I think uh, even though Obama doesn't favor uh, Biden, he would rather have Trump defeated than not. So uh, that's where we are uh, with that. That's my, my impression. Uh, and um, I won't say, um, a nasty word. Uh, let me say this. At one time, Obama, in regard to Biden, about something that was going on, well, it was a usual mess up by Joe. A usual mess up by Joe. But he used a different word. Um, so I don't think he really has that much confidence in Biden, frankly. And uh, I think Olga was up before uh, maybe someone else. Olga. Thank you for the lecture. I understand that people in the States elect the elector. And uh, my question is, uh, why don't people oppose this system of election? Uh, why do they oppose it or support it? Yes, you're right, Op oppose. Well, because... Um, you know, these days in all countries, uh, the popular vote by the people is what is expected. It's the political ethos, the political ethic that it should be popular vote. And um, so uh, uh, that's why people should be. Now you get into a problem. If you just add up all the votes across the country, in which case the big states would um, prevail or do you figure out some other weighted uh, way of voting? And so uh, the solution is not that easy to determine. The, um, uh, uh, there are committees and organizations put together to try to change it and they don't go anywhere. After any of these close elections, they don't go anywhere. Uh, they, never, they don't have enough um, political traction. Also, the framers of our constitution not, wanting not to have the constitution easily changed made it difficult. They made it difficult to do anything because they didn't think the government should be powerful in people's lives. So they made it difficult to change it. And uh, it's a hard time arriving at what the solution is and then to get it approved. So uh, let me uh, also go to um, someone else uh, here. 
who, uh, let's see what's, what's happening over there. And we can't quite see your picture, but there's something else or someone else in the picture there. So go ahead. May I ask? Yes. Uh, thank you for the lecture. My name is Marina Dmitrieva, and I'm a member of the Department of International Relations. And my question is related to the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan. And is the Afghan issue important in this election campaign? And how did the American society react to the news that the Taliban supports Trump? Right. Uh, well, actually, um, it's not an issue at all. And it was a little bit of a help to Trump four years ago because he campaigned to withdraw troops. He called it the endless wars, that we should not have endless wars and have American money spent and wasted and have uh, American troops killed. And worse than even being killed, I think, for a lot of these people is to be terribly wounded and maimed. And there's a good amount of visibility about that. Uh, he still wants to do this. He tries to do it, but the generals won't let him. Uh, they want to keep troops um, uh, in place overseas. They can't, um, you know, they just can't uh, agree to it for whatever reasons. But Trump is trying to bring the troops home and uh, he doesn't have enough support. The foreign policy establishment, which is, represents Democrats and Republicans, cannot, uh, they, they don't want to do this. They think it's forfeiting American leadership. So Trump wants to bring them home. He says, bring home 20,000. And they say, only bring home six, as an example, only 6,000. So it's a contentious issue uh, of, of foreign policy and also military uh, policy. So, uh, but it's, it is absolutely not an issue in this campaign and it should be. But again, foreign policy is usually not an issue in the campaign only if somebody attacks the United States in October or some event happens and they call it the October surprise, but it's not happened and Afghanistan troop withdrawals uh, as a non-issue. Well, let's see, is there anyone else that hasn't asked a question that would like to? I'll look around here. Uh, we, uh, we've been very happy at the number of people that have turned out. And Bill, also Bill, I, think, uh, I think we have uh, one more question in the chat space. Please uh, look it up if possible uh, from, from Yaroslav Shevchenko, I think question. Oh, okay. Long one. It, Very good. Go ahead. Actually, it's, it's uh, could, could you read it? It's it's in the chat space. At, at the oh, top the, down the... here in the corner? Yes, yes. All right. You unmute. The A. Okay, can, can you see it? Yeah, now I think he did. Oh, no, I, I don't see which one it is. Okay, so let me uh, let me ask my own question uh, then, if, if you don't mind. Actually, I also have a question, uh, and uh, uh, it's about uh, Donald Trump. Actually, uh, so it does look like Trump is gonna lose this election. You you can't have you know too many miracles with Trump, and he already. Uh, had uh, his own miracle uh, four years ago. So my question is, what's going to happen uh, to Trump uh, uh, if he loses? Uh, so is Trump going to be uh, going to stay like a powerful force uh, in U.S. politics uh, even uh, even uh, after his uh, defeat? Uh, so is he going to influence American politics uh, in any significant uh, way when he ceases uh, to, to be uh, a president of the U.S.? Thanks. Right. Well, this is entirely my own personal assessment and judgment. I've not read anything about or heard anything, anyone say anything about uh, that eventuality that he would, uh, what he would do. 
my own guess is that he'll be finished with politics, that he will, he might be asked his opinion because it would be a colorful opinion, but he, uh, he'll be done with it. He had a good life with his family. His son is growing up and uh, I think he'll be happy to go back to uh, civilian life, uh, be involved with his real estate projects and uh, not, uh, other, other than being questioned, okay? Other than being questioned, he's not gonna intrude himself into this. He, he will go back to a luxurious lifestyle and, and leave it at that. So that's just my opinion. Okay, so uh, one more one more question, if I may. So uh, speaking of the uh, Republican Party politicians, so apart from Trump, uh, do you see any Republican figures uh, who could, you know, who could become our U.S. president? Uh, maybe after twenty twenty four, you know, people like Mike Pompeo or Josh Hawley or maybe uh, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> well, I enjoy watching Tucker Carlson. He's a good analyst, but um, I don't think he, he, I think he will uh, rather stay in his current position. So um, I think that uh, it's rumored that Pompeo would be interested in running for president. Um, but his big, um, you know, qualifications um, are having run the CIA and have been Secretary of State. So that's all foreign policy, foreign affairs uh, issues, not domestic policies, which revolve around, uh, so, you know, uh, more bread and butter issues, as we say. But I mean, I think it's expected that he might run. Uh, there are a couple of people, younger men who are in their 40s, um, who um, speak well and appear well, and while conservative are not over the top with their philosophies, uh, Ben Sass is one of them, Ben Sass. Um, but I'll tell you someone who's definitely gonna run. Um, and that is Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. Nikki Haley is going to run. Uh, you know, she was a governor of South Carolina. So she has domestic experience as executive and she was uh, ambassador to the United Nations so she has the foreign experience. So, and just the moves that she has made um, this time around, supporting Trump, which she did not do 2016 before the nomination. Um, she is very savvy and she would be a very attractive candidate, very attractive candidate for the Republicans. But, um, you know, uh, it'll be the question of whether Biden you know, wants to run for a second term if he's elected, or maybe he'll be happy with one term and that's it. I mean, he'll be 82 years old uh, when he's running again. Um, so maybe they'll ease him out somehow. Kamala Harris would, or if there's some something that occurs that she becomes president, but uh, whether it's Biden or, or Kamala Harris, who's ever a president for the Democrats, it'll be very hard to beat them because they will have assembled a uh, coalition of voters supporting them. So even if you have an attractive Republican, um, they're gonna have a tough fight. It'll be a tough fight again in 2024. So, uh, well, I hope you invite me back uh, before, yeah, yeah. before that year, so. <laughs> Yeah, Bill, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, our time uh, is almost up. Uh, so let me uh, thank you uh, uh, on behalf of, uh, of all the audience. And uh, we, uh, we did have a very large audience uh, today, we, which means, uh, you know, uh, our students uh, are uh, qu quite interested in, uh, in what you had to, to, to tell them. So uh, I think, uh, well, uh, we'll be happy to invite you back uh, maybe after, uh, not in 2024, but uh, much <laughs> more than that. <laughs> than that. Uh, so maybe uh, you, you will agree to, to, to give a talk, you know, er, early, er, early next year uh, after the inauguration uh, or the next US president, who, whoever 
or whoever uh, it will be. So uh, I, I hope we'll stay in touch. Uh, and uh, thank, thank you. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed the questions and happy to see Victoria. Uh, there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was a real treat for us. Thanks. That was well, wonderful. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And as I say, I look forward to actually visiting the campus at some time before too long. Let's hope yeah. for pandemic to be over and then right. it will be much an easier task. Right. Very good. Thank you all very much. You're very smart students who are following international affairs. So bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.